and thank you for joining us today. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. With that, I will hand it over to Minister of Finance, Selena Robinson. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we here are on the territory of the Lekwungen peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Last week, I joined my colleagues to talk more about building back better from recent climate related disasters and actions that we are taking to make sure that people and communities throughout British Columbia are protected from future events. Today we are here to talk about our commitment to fight climate change. Three years ago, our government introduced Clean BC, the most progressive climate plan in North America. Budget 2022 builds on the $2.3 billion in funding alloc allocated for Clean BC to date and invests even more in the fight against climate change. Now, some perhaps would have chosen to roll back investments given everything we have all seen through this pandemic, but we are making a clear choice, a choice to strengthen our investments and build back better. These investments are about all of us, connecting our health, and our well-being with the health and well-being of our environment. In Budget 2022, we are accelerating actions to help meet the province's greenhouse gas emissions targets. And with these actions, continue, continue to build a strong, sustainable economy. The opportunities are tremendous. And even in the face of climate-related disasters that we've been through recently, these are exciting opportunities. And with that, I'd like to invite uh, Minister George Heyman, Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy, to join us with more details. Minister? Thank you very much, Minister Robinson. And I want to acknowledge with uh, gratitude that I'm joining you today from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. Every British Columbian who went through the events of the last 12 months, whether it was the heat dome, the wildfires, the, uh, the flooding, the unpredictable uh, weather events, knows that British Columbia has joined those jurisdictions around the world that are on the front line of the climate crisis and are feeling the impacts in very profound ways. That's why today uh, it's such a pleasure uh, and it's also so important to announce that British Columbia once again is making record investments through Budget 2022 and our Clean BC Climate Action Program to both fight climate change, to prepare British Columbians and our communities for the impacts of climate change and to build a cleaner, stronger economy for everyone. Today's release of a new UN climate report simply underscores the challenges ahead of everyone around the globe, challenges we know we have to meet. In particular, I was struck by the comments that we not only needed to fight climate change and adapt to it, but we needed to understand the profound impact that climate change is having today on the mental health of our citizens and in particular of young people who are living with uncertainty. We need to invest in security, in livability and in a sustainable future. That's why Clean BC, I think, is showing a way forward and offering real solutions, not just talk, but real solutions backed up by significant budgetary investments to reduce emissions across our communities, across where we live, and across our transportation systems. We need to continue to have one of the strongest plans, climate plans, if not the strongest climate plan in North America. And of course, our programs have received international recognition. One of the programs I'll speak about later that supports our industry to decarbonize was recognized at, in Glasgow as an award-winning, most creative climate solution program. The plan in our roadmap to 2030 accelerates many of the actions we already had underway and it expands the number of them. And we will continue to do that. 
We'll continue to look at the success of our programs, at opportunities for making our uh, programs better, for uh, moving up timelines as we have, for instance, in zero emission vehicles in order to continue to reduce emissions. And to do that, we're investing $1.2 billion in new funding across all sectors, building on the $2.3 billion that have already been budgeted in the past to implement our Clean BC programs. That includes investments in transportation, in new technologies, and particularly to support communities around British Columbia. We are launching a new local government climate action program that's designed to help communities fight climate change, reduce their emissions, and make their communities both healthier and stronger right across BC. We designed the program with input from uh, representatives on the Climate Solutions Council from both urban and interior uh, municipalities as well as from the Union of BC Municipalities. And I know in a moment Minister Cullen will talk about this program in more detail. But in addition to that program, Budget 2022 also means that hundreds of millions of dollars in new investments will spur clean technology, innovation, and jobs in British Columbia through the Clean BC program for industry. The budget will support people as they make the switch that they have said overwhelmingly they want to make to clean transportation, to electric vehicles. There is record funding for more rebates to make this switch more affordable nearly $250 million through our low carbon fuel standard credits. We've already seen uh, people in British Columbia respond in record numbers. We have the highest uptake of zero emission vehicles per capita across North America. And three years ago, when we set our target for 2025, we didn't expect that we would blow past that target in 2021. We are already at 13% when our target was 10, and that led us to update our target to ensure that we will achieve 90% zero emission vehicles for all new car sales by 2030 and 100% by 2035. We're also making a range of other clean options more affordable through tax supports. We're removing the provincial sales tax on electric vehicle uh, sales of, uh, of used uh, electric vehicles. And we're doing the same for the purchase of new heat pumps. And we'll continue to support low and moderate income people with $120 million added to carbon tax relief through the Climate Action Tax Credit for low and moderate income people. One of the hallmarks of our Clean BC plan and our fight against climate change is to ensure that the plan remains focused on people, that we're building opportunities for people in a new clean economy while at the same time addressing their fears for the future and their concerns about affordability today. We're working with Indigenous communities. This budget also invests in the Indigenous Forest Bioeconomy Program. Let me give you one example. A little over a decade ago, I was a guest of the Gitgat people in Hartley Bay and they were celebrating around that period of time transferring off diesel generated electricity to small local hydro that they had built. Today, in this remote community, with leadership from uh, Krista, who is uh, on the screen behind me, who has served as the health director for the Gitgat Nations Health Department for four years, the entire community, 52 homes, have electric heat pumps installed. They were installed with support from the Clean BC Indigenous Community Heat Pump Program. And not only are their electricity bills going down, as they will for everyone who adopts heat pumps, they also double as air conditioners to ensure that we can live in safety and comfort if we experience future events like last summer's heat dome. This is what kept people safe in Hartley Bay during last summer's heat wave. And it's just one example of the kind of supports we're offering Indigenous people through Clean BC as we address the climate crisis moving forward. There are many more roadmap actions that need to be implemented 
in a short time period. I continue to work with staff and the Climate Action Secretariat to review our programs, to improve them, ensure they're effective, and ensure they're cost efficient for British Columbians. All of this requires all of us working together. And that's what this budget does across all sectors. I'd now like to pass it over to Minister Nathan Cullen to talk about our efforts to support and work with local governments and communities as we implement Clean BC. Thank you, Minister Heyman. Thank you, Minister Robinson. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nathan Cullen. I'm the MLA from Stikine. I would also like to acknowledge that we're speaking to you from the Kwangan speaking people's territories. And uh, I'm so thrilled to be here for this event. This is my first uh, media event as the new Minister of Municipal Affairs. And what a, an excellent subject to be talking about, fighting climate, the climate crisis, with such incredible partners in the Ministers of Environment and Finance. From wildfires to extreme heat, to flooding and mudslides, this place we call home has never been at greater risk from the effects of climate change. When BC communities were hit with multiple devastating weather events, local governments were on the front lines providing critical services to people where they needed them most. Local governments have always been there for British Columbians when it comes to driving action for climate change. And that's why our government is going to be there for them. 187 local governments signed on to the Climate Action Charter. And today we are investing in cleaner energy, sustainable infrastructure, and reducing pollution. We are all inspired by the leadership local governments have shown in protecting people and communities from climate change and the steps they continue to take. Like the city of Kamloops, who is looking to reduce emissions by 80% while also increasing their resilience to the impacts of climate change. Or like the town of Golden, who's committed to transitioning to 100% renewable energy by 2050. And in my communities across the Northwest, we've seen communities like Smithers and Terrace and Haida Gwaii take on huge efforts in their infrastructure and their programming to make sure that they're playing their part. I know that many local governments have big ambitions to fight climate change, and the province is here to support those goals and to, in fact, amplify their work as our local partners. Because we know that the only way we'll reach our climate goals is if we work together. We have heard the call from local governments for a flexible, predictable funding program to help them achieve their climate goals, and Budget 2022 delivers on those calls. $76 million over three years for local governments to plan and implement projects that support Clean BC Roadmap, the Climate Preparedness and Adaptation Strategy, and their local climate action objectives. This program was developed with input from the Climate Solutions Council, including representatives from rural and urban regions of the province and the UBCM, and we are grateful for their help. My colleague, Minister Heyman, and I look forward to sharing more details about the program in coming weeks. But this is just one more example of the actions we're taking to support local governments as they face climate change objectives of tomorrow. We've revitalized the Green Communities Committee, a partnership between the Union of BC Municipalities and the province to support the progress local governments have made towards reducing their greenhouse gas emissions and creating more complete, compact, and energy efficient communities. Through this committee, ministry and local government staff are working together on a climate program that will provide communities with supports to make better land use decisions. We'll also have more to say about this in the coming months. This past year has been incredibly challenging for many British Columbians, and local leaders have been on the front lines of keeping people and communities safe from extreme weather and natural disaster. It's clear that many of these communities still need financial support to wholly recover from the impacts. And we know it's critical that infrastructure is built back to a more resilient standard. My colleagues and I across government will continue to work with all orders of government to support recovery and respond to the financial needs of communities as they work to rebuild public infrastructure that people rely on. I'll be sharing more of this as well in the future. I'd now like to 
turn uh, the attention over to our friend from Kamloops, Councillor Arjun Singh, to say a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Cullen. Uh, so um, I also want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, from Unceded Traditional Ancestral Squatmic Territory in the city of Kamloops. Uh, I'm a councillor in Kamloops and also director of the Thompson Nicola Regional District. Um, I should probably take this opportunity first to welcome Mr. Minister Cullen to uh, a really important job in, in provincial government. Uh, got big footsteps to fill with uh, Minister Osborne and before Minister Robinson in the role. Uh, welcome, Mr. Cullen. Look forward to many opportunities to discuss with you uh, lots of different important files. Um, the um, uh, I did have a good chance to talk this morning with uh, our UBCM president. I'm a life member of UBCM, past president of UBCM, but our current president, Lorianne Rudenberg from Cornell, uh, and all UBCM is also very excited by this, and they'll be talking more about that uh, as the days and uh, and um, and um, weeks go by for sure. Um, None of this climate work is particularly easy, uh, but there's a massive opportunity for us to all work together across governments, uh, across political parties, uh, a whole of society approach. And I would note that I think there's an increasing ambition on the part of local governments uh, across the province uh, to really lean into uh, this work, as there is obviously at the province and at the federal level. Um, with Kamloops, we did um, this uh, last year, actually on the hottest day in recorded history in, in Kamloops, uh, the City Council in Kamloops unanimously approved uh, a climate action plan that is very ambitious, that actually uh, does try and meet the goals set out in Paris uh, for uh, do our part uh, to meet those goals locally in, in our community. Um, and you know, we are uh, looking at things that are all around the community. We're looking at things around uh, transportation and electric electric vehicles, uh, just bicycles, walking, active transportation in that way, looking at our land use patterns, uh, looking at uh, building retrofits and, and new buildings and trying to meet all the step code um, goals that we all have. And also uh, retrofitting existing building stock is gonna be uh, a big opportunity and a big challenge. So um, very obviously this money uh, that our provincial colleagues um, have made available uh, is going to be extremely useful, I think, to us. Um, uh, obviously, design still to come, or more design, but I think the actual idea that's with three times the amount of uh, what the old funding was uh, is very exciting for, for Kamloops and for our region. Uh, and, um, you know, one of the things that I've always said to myself is that, uh, you know, plans are one thing. Uh, you have to start investing in those plans and, and putting them in the budgets and within the city of Kamloops and across local governments, across BC, we're all going through our budgeting processes right now. And uh, we are actually in the city of Kamloops looking at uh, putting a, a, a budget line in for climate, uh, which we've never done before. So it's a pretty exciting time to be working uh, with our provincial colleagues, our federal colleagues, to make sure that uh, you know we're all meeting this moment. And um, coming from a region of the, of the province that was has been devastated by extreme weather, uh, you know, the mitigation aspects on all these things to make it not any worse going forward is so very important to us. And we feel it very viscerally in terms of um, the work that we have to do. So uh, we're, we're excited for this uh, new uh, pocket of money. We were obviously worried when CARP went away. And uh, I think um, we'll appreciate the opportunity for uh, the province to listen to local governments uh, now and going forward, obviously on these uh, important files. So. Um, I, I do say on Promises Climate Solutions Council, very happy for that appointment. And I'm also uh, thankful for the work that we've done there uh, with, the, with the minister and the Ministry of uh, Environment and Climate Change to help uh, help uh, shape this uh, funding stream. So thanks again. I'm, I think I'm turning it back over to Minister Robinson, a dear friend of mine, and uh, uh, who we miss in municipal affairs, but is doing a great job in finance. So Minister, over to you. Thank you, Arjun, and, and I miss you too. <laughs> so I would uh, now like to introduce Neil Johnston, the incoming CEO of the Fraser Academy, a K-12 school which specializes in education for learners with dyslexia. The Academy was one of the first schools in BC to purchase an electric school bus under the Clean BC Go Electric program. Neil joins us from Vancouver. Neil? Thank you, Minister. I'm delighted to be here today on behalf of Fraser Academy. 
Fraser Academy benefited from the specially use vehicle incentive program in 2021. We were thrilled to receive this grant re rebate. As a nonprofit and charity, it was very much key in helping us afford a new electric bus for our students and to continue our efforts to become a greener and more responsible organization. Fraser Academy knows it has, a play, has to play an active part in addressing climate change. Purchasing, purchasing this electric bus with the support of the Clean BC programs was so important for our entire community. It helped, us, it helped us introduce our first electric bus to our fleet, which may well be the first electric school bus in the province. We were actually able to proudly purchase it from a local company called Green Power Motor Company, who is also leading the way in BC in helping organizations reduce their carbon footprint. We know that today's youth are rightly holding government and organizations more responsible for addressing climate change. Our students were thrilled, absolutely thrilled actually, to see us take this further action. It also showed to our staff and community that we are increasing our commitment to be a more environmentally conscious organization. Thank you again for the opportunity to apply to Clean BC programs. 100% they incentivize and help influence our commitment to be greener and more responsible. We had hoped to benefit from future programs as we continue these efforts, and we certainly applaud today's announcement by the ministers. Thank you for your leadership as BC importantly continues to address climate change. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Neil, and thank you for sharing uh, the perspective of students and their passion for knowing that uh, as a government and as all orders of government, that we're, uh, we're working hard to make sure that, uh, that the planet that we call home is there for future generations. So investing in the low carbon economy, supporting cleaner transportation and energy efficient buildings, initiatives to decarbonize and reduce emissions from communities, innovative programs that reuse and collect plastic materials from the existing waste stream, giving BC a chance to advance as a circular economy and fundamentally change for the better, moving forward with clean tech innovation and partnership opportunities. This is the clean BC that will make us all proud and make us ready together for the fight ahead against climate change so that we can all have a stronger future. Thank you very much for joining us, and I'm here to um, help coordinate uh, responses to any questions that, that you may have. Thank you very much. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. Our first question today comes from Belle Puri, CBC. Uh, hi there. My uh, question, please, is for uh, Minister Heyman. So, I mean, we're hearing about um, money to reduce pollution emissions, uh, set environmental goals. Um, but uh, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change um, report has been released, and it says, of course, that Canada can expect heavy rainfall and flooding to continue um, like we've had in the last year. So things that have already happened in BC. How is the government preparing to manage more of these disasters in the years ahead? Mr. Heyman? Thank you very much, Bell, for the question. Uh, we are doing a number of things. For the uh, in the last fiscal year, we in phase one of our climate preparedness and adaptation strategy. While we put out uh, the more complete uh, phase two of the strategy for public comment, we are very, very close to announcing uh, uh, the implementation of a range of measures from phase two of that program, whether it's floodplain mapping, whether it is uh, uh, support for, uh, uh, for communities in the province to do uh, climate uh, monitoring and modeling in a, a number of locations around the province. We've seen other initiatives uh, through uh, a year-round uh, wildfire service to uh, work on mitigating the risk of wildfires. We are helping communities that were devastated by the atmospheric river flooding to rebuild, but we are not stopping there. The $83 million in this year's budget, Budget 2022, for the Climate Preparedness and Adaptation Strategy will help us determine where communities are at greatest risk and what we need to do to uh, lower that risk and ensure that people remain safe in the impacts that we will see from climate change in the future. Bell, do you have a follow-up? No, I'm fine. Thank you. 
Thanks very much. For our next question, we go to Lisa Yuzda, City News. Hi, taking a, a different topic here, and, and I'm hoping, uh, Minister Robinson, you might be able to help me out with some of these. Looking at the Ukraine and Russia and uh, BC's investments in Russian-backed or Russian-owned entities, I'm wondering what BC can do, what the province is considering doing as far as divesting from those, how soon that could happen. And also in the longer term, could BC's civil forfeiture process be used for any uh, you know, entities owned here or, or properties owned here that might be owned by someone who is you know, in Russia and backing um, this, I guess, uh, ultimately backing Russia and backing this invasion on Ukraine? Uh, th thanks, Lisa, for the question. Um, so uh, you've likely already he heard that we've taken uh, Russian uh, spirits and beers um, out of our of our liquor stores. Uh, that that action we, we took last week. I've already asked staff to take a look at the Landowner Transparency Act to see if uh, you know what information uh, we have. Uh, the RCMP have full um, access to that, and we're you know we're working in coordination with the federal government, uh, making sure that we're continuing to do our part as British Columbians uh, to uh, make it really clear about this egregious uh, act being taken by Russia on Ukraine is not acceptable, uh, and we're continuing to explore um, other ways uh, with the leadership of the federal government to uh, to uh, deliver uh, our commitment to support the people of Ukraine. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? I do. Asking on behalf of a colleague who's working on this story today, uh, realtors, the real estate industry on the sales side of things is um, frustrated that with the cooling off period that the province has said, saying that it's going to harm their, you know, or ultimately harm them and their ability to do business. So I'm wondering what your response is to that. We've been saying all along that uh, when you have a, an overheated market, we're seeing um, you know people really challenged and really stressed with um, having to make decisions on the spot without getting uh, you know inspection, making sure that their financing is in order, and that's creating real challenges, real consumer protection challenges for people who are making probably the largest financial decision of their of their lives, and that's why we said we would bring in a cooling off period, and that's why we tasked the BCFSA to uh, to do the consultation with with all. Uh, components with all stakeholders in in their real estate industry um, understanding you know how what's the best way to move forward on this uh, and I know that the you know I've certainly heard from the realtors and, and their concerns uh, but that's why we asked the BCFSA to do the research uh, to provide us with an analysis about how to best move forward for the next question we go to Richard Zussman Global News and just to get some specifics, Minister, on Lisa's first question, should the BC Investment Management Corporation divest more than $450 million in investments in uh, Russian uh, government and Russian-owned uh, uh, companies? BC Investment Management um, um, Corporation is, is separate from government um, because of the, the risk of conflict of interest, and so we, we don't direct them. Uh, and so I think it's really up to them to to make those decisions uh, on, on behalf of their um, uh, on the folks that invest uh, with them. Richard, do you have a follow up? Considering the Minister of Finance's role with BC IMC, you could no doubt provide some overall guidance. Like, is the position of your government one that the major pension investment fund should or should not be investing in these major uh, Russian companies? Again, it's, it is arm's length, but it, it's completely separate uh, for good reason, uh, so that uh, there is no, you know, conflict of interest. And so they do make their uh, decisions independent of government influence. For the next question, we go to Dave Branco, CKPG Radio. Good morning. Uh, for Minister Heyman, please. Um, regarding the BC wildfires, um, uh, what role does the BC wildfire staff as a year-round service play as a way to fight climate change? Thank you very much. I think uh, the purpose of establishing the BC Wildfire Service as a year-round service was partly in recognition of um, both the earlier uh, uh, and the longer uh, fire seasons as well as the intensity. But it was also a recognition that uh, those uh, professionals who fight wildfires, if we want to keep uh, the most skilled and experienced uh, 
wildfire fighters uh, in the BC Public Service uh, as part of the wildfire service. Uh, they need some security of income and also we want to and we need to uh, take advantage of their knowledge about fire behavior to help us uh, predict and take action uh, to mitigate the risks, whether it's uh, it's working with uh, with indigenous people on uh, traditional cultural prescribed burning, uh, the, the history that uh, BC has had of our own uh, prescribed burning programs, different programs we've had in the past to reduce interface fuels. There are a range of measures that uh, the wildfire service will be, I'm sure, undertaking. Uh, the detail, of course, you'd have to get from the. Uh, the Minister of Forests, but this is an important shift uh, in British Columbia's approach to both wildfires and ensuring that we, we knit together uh, the measures to protect British Columbians uh, from the impacts of climate change with those professionals who have been fighting fires for years. Dave, did you have a follow-up? No, that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. We have time for one more question today. We'll go to Nelson Bennett, Business in Vancouver. Yes, um, a lot of what you spoke about today is essentially a recap of what was in the provincial budget um, last week. I presume what's really new here is this uh, this new fund uh, for local governments. Uh, is it seventy six million? Um, I was just wondering, uh, is is that the the main thing that's new here? And uh, also, just maybe hoping to get some uh, explanation of what sort of initiatives that that funding might uh, might might fund at the local level uh, thanks for the question a, a, a couple of differences and and they're significant one is significantly more dollars because we realize the challenges in front of us are of this uh, scale and grade and also a deepening of the partnership with our local municipalities and modern treaty nations as the ones on the front lines who will be able to implement this, is the co-development of making the program, as we've talked about, flexible, and also something that people can uh, rely on. When councils and mayors, modern treaty nations are making their plans, knowing that they have something in place that they can count on and that it goes out over a number of years, and has the kind of flexibility that they need to make the programs work for their communities in the best way to fight the climate crisis, make their communities more resilient for the number of the things that we've talked about. That's what's innovative in this, and it's a, a marked improvement, as the president of UBCM and others have said, over what was previously done in support of communities fighting the climate crisis. Nelson, did you have a follow-up? Okay, thank you. All right, with no follow-up then, that will conclude today's availability. Thank you, everybody, for being available and joining us.